Hello everybody. We move on to, well, more properties of functional limits. So we finished the last video on properties of functional limits with something I called the divergence criterion for functional limits, which said that if you had a function with domain D and you had some limit point, call it A of D, and you knew that there were two sequences, F dot and Y dot, which are both going to be D not equal to A sequences. So these are sequences in D, but you're not allowed to use A, which both have the property that they converge to A. And if furthermore, you know that the limit of the F image of X is not the same as the limit of the F image of Y, then this implies that the limit at A for F does not exist. So I want to start this video by doing an example of, uh, well, it, it's one of our, our going to be one of our favorite examples, or at least the beginning of one of our favorite examples, uh, which is uh, what you might call the first of our monster functions. Uh, and that is the function sine of 1 over x. Now, away from x equals 0, this function is not like super duper interesting. Uh, but near 0, right, this function starts to look a little weird. In fact, let's go take a look at this function in Desmos right now. Okay, so we hop over to Desmos where we're going to plot sine of 1 over x. We turn this on. And woo-wee, all right? Now we're looking here between about, oh, it looks like negative three and a half and three. And if we zoom out, you can see it's actually pretty well behaved, right? It looks like as X goes to infinity or minus infinity, uh, you just get a little horizontal asymptote at zero, which makes sense because when X gets very, very large, whether positive or negative, one over X is going to get very, very small. In fact, it'll be getting close to zero. And sine of zero is zero. So it's not surprising that in the limit to the left and the right, we go to zero. But what about as x approaches zero? It looks like Desmos is having some sort of a seizure here. Right? Like it's just going up and down and up and down. And it can't keep these things far apart that you can actually see the difference. Like it just looks like, whoa, it just looks like somebody filled it in with a highlighter, right? Of course, as you move away from this highlighter section, you can see there are some small little gaps and they get bigger as you go out further away. Now, at zero itself, this function is not defined. But could it be that as you approach zero, for x, that sine of one over x does approach something? Maybe zero, maybe one, maybe negative one unclear from the graph, all right? But let's see if we go back, if this divergence uh, criterion can tell us anything. Okay, so the divergence criterion suggests that if we can find two sequences that converge to the same point, and in this case, my A is going to be zero, all right? So we're gonna find, we'll find X dot converging to zero, and y dot converging to zero, such that the limit of sine of, well, in this case, one over x dot, is not going to be the same thing as the limit of sine of one over y dot. And this will imply that the limit as x approaches zero of sine of one over x does not exist. So let's see how we do this. So first observation. We know that sine of 0 is 0. Also, sine of 2 pi is 0. And sine of 4 pi is 0. And in fact, if I just keep on adding 2 pi, right, on the unit circle, I keep ending up at this point on the far right side, and the sine is always 0. So what I'm going to do is define my x dot to be the sequence whose nth term is going to be 1 over 2 pi times n. 
All right, now wait, why, why is this 1 over in there? Well, I know that sine of 2 pi is 0, but my function is 1 over. So I invert the 2 pi so that when I put it into this sine of 1 over, it inverts it back. All right, and then the n here is just some positive integer. So we could start that, say, at 1. Okay, and now what happens when I apply sine to say x sub n, or 1 over x sub n. Well, this is going to be the sine of 1 over 1 over 2 pi n, which is going to be sine of 2 pi n, which equals 0. So in fact, the sine of 1 over x dot is always equal to 0, which implies that the limit of sine of 1 over x dot is equal to zero. Okay, so I have a sequence. Of course, oh, by the way, right, like we need to know it converges to zero, and of course it does, because as n goes to infinity, one over two pi n is getting very, very small. This goes to zero. But now let's write down another sequence where all I'm gonna do is take this two pi n, right, so that's this dot, and I'm gonna rotate up by pi over two. Okay, so this was your pi over 2. Okay, but this over here, you could think of this as 2 pi n, and this is actually 2 pi n plus a pi over 2. And as n goes to infinity, this sequence still converges to 0. However, if I look at sine of 1 over y sub n, this would be the sine of, well, let's just skip through all the uh, reciprocal reciprocals, we get 2 pi n plus pi over 2. And the sine of something of the form 2 pi n plus pi over 2 is actually 1. And therefore, the limit of the sine of 1 over y dot is equal to 1. So I have two sequences, x and y, which both converge to 0. But the sine of the reciprocal of the sequence, in one case, converges to 0 and the other case converges to 1. So by the divergence criterion, uh, so by the divergence criterion, the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of 1 over x does not exist. All right, and this is actually really handy. Uh, if we go back to our functional limits, we had an example, this h of x. Uh, it was equal to 3 up to when x equals 7, and then it was equal to 1 when x was greater than 7. If we just go back to this example and use the divergence criterion, we can very easily see that the limit as x approaches 7 doesn't exist. We simply have to write down two sequences. So let's see. As x approaches 7 from the left, well, how do I do that? Okay, well, how about I take 7 and I subtract 1 over n? So as n is getting uh, larger, 7 minus 1 over n is converging to 7. Okay, and then let me take y to be 7 plus 1 over n. This also is going to converge to 7. However, if I take h of x sub uh, x dot, right, what is this thing doing, right? What is h of, say, x sub n? Well, this is going to be h of 7 minus 1 over n. And because 7 minus 1 over n is less than 7, we know that this h is always equal to 3. Right? That was our definition. Before you get to 7, the value of the function is 3. And if I do h of y sub n, this will be h of 7 plus 1 over n. But now this 7 plus 1 over n is greater than 7. And once you're greater than 7, the value of the function is 1. So this tells me that the limit as x approaches uh, uh, 7 of h of x does not exist. All right, because we can see here h of x dot, right? So this told us h of x dot converges to 3, whereas h of y dot 
converges to 1. In fact, it's just equal to 1 constantly. Okay, so by the divergence criterion, that's it. Like, we don't have to go through the definition. And, and that's pretty nice. All right, so this is a pretty handy way of showing that a limit does not exist. Now, there's, of course, a lot of times where you want limits to exist. And as we uh, saw when we were working with sequences, it's going to be really nice if we know that certain limits exist, that we can use those to build other limits. So here comes a new theorem, but it's really just a redux of the, our old theorems. This is the algebraic functional limits theorem. Okay, so the algebraic functional limits theorem, we're going to start with some functions, and we know that uh, a limits exist for these, right? So let's say we have two functions, f and g, from some common domain d, and a will be some limit point of d. Okay, such that, well, let's assume that the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to k, and we'll assume that the a limit of g is equal to L. Okay, again, very important hypotheses. We have to know that these limits exist for the other things we write to make sense. All right, so, uh, and then I guess we're going to probably want um, uh, some constant alpha, right? So, uh, if we have some constant, then, okay, number one, and this is where we need the constant. If I take the a limit of alpha times f, then this is the same thing as alpha times the a limit of f, which of course is equal to alpha times k. Okay, so this is the, the homogeneity rule. All right, second, if I take the a limit of f plus g, then this is equal to the sum of the a limits of f and g. Or k plus l. And if I replace addition with multiplication, then everything works just the same way. So this is our additivity and our multiplicativity. All right, next, of course, is the divisibility criterion, okay? So if I have the a limit of f over g, this will be equal to the quotient of the a limit of f by the a limit of g, or k over l. Of course, this is provided that L doesn't equal zero, okay? We get a little bit of a problem when we try to divide by zero. All right, so I want you to go back, compare this with what we did with sequences, and you'll say, oh, that looks mighty, mighty much the same. That's right, it is. And uh, well, this isn't the last time we're gonna see some sort of an algebraic theorem. In fact, in our next section, which will come in the next video on continuous functions, we're going to build our way up to having an algebraic continuity theorem. All right. Well, we will see you all next time.